Um, my job at the Water and Leaf Conservation Trust is uh, that my job title is Community and Volunteers Officer, uh, which means I'm, I manage the volunteer teams and the teams that come from the community, youth groups and corporate groups in doing practical conservation along the Water of Leaf. Um, my job also includes doing quite a lot of uh, research about the wildlife in the river so that I know what conservation tasks to do and I can monitor whether the work that we're doing is working or not from the point of view of boosting biodiversity. So um, this is the course of the Water of Leith here. It starts in the Colsium Springs, about six miles upstream of Harper Rig Reservoir. The Water of Leith doesn't become the Water of Leith until three ferns merge just above Harper Rig. Um, the highest of those three burns is called Westburn. Uh, and this is uh, me at the top of Westburn here, uh, and uh, a colleague Rob drinking from the source of the water of Leith. The area all around here is uh, it's 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 not a part of the Pentland Hills that is visited very often. I don't think um, there are as adders up there. Uh, uh, you access it via Crosswood Reservoir, uh, and then it's about a three mile walk through very uh, nice peat moorland uh, until you find the, the, the spring welling up from the middle of the peat moorland. After the Colsium Springs, uh, the three rivers merge and go into Harper Rig Reservoir and then come out the other side. Uh, and the land use around there is uh, all sort of, it's mostly grazed agricultural fields, either sheep or cattle farming. There has been a little bit of replanting done up there um, uh, and the river itself is, is, is very shallow and very narrow uh, compared to what it's like when you hit Belerno. So uh, the Belerno is the city boundary of Edinburgh and it's from here that the river uh, becomes a lot more woody either side of it uh, and the banks are, it's a bit more of a gully. Uh, the Bavelaw Burn joins the Water of Leith in Belerno, which comes down from Harlaw and uh, Thurrocknall Reservoir in the Pentland. Uh, and that sort of swelling of water uh, establishes the river into more like the Water of Leith that we sort of are familiar with in the middle of Edinburgh. After Belerno, it runs through Curry and Juniper Green into Collington uh, and Collington Dells, Craig Lockhart Dells, uh, and, and then into Slateford. And this is where the Water of Leith Visitor Centre is and the Slateford Aqueduct and the Slateford Viaduct. And it's from here that I feel that the Water of Leith becomes uh, a lot more urban in its surroundings. Uh, a mile after Slateford, it hits, it goes underneath Gorgie Road and through Chesser and Sopton Park. This slide here is just downstream of Gorgie Road. The, the rather bleak looking building is 500 uh, Gorgie Road, Chesser House. Uh, and although this is not a very attractive slide, I always keep it in because this is the first place I ever saw a kingfisher on the Water of Leith. And for me, I feel like even though it might be not as aesthetically pleasing in some parts of the Water of Leith as it goes through the city, it's such an important wildlife habitat still, and a really, really significant corridor in Edinburgh allowing wildlife to move about. Some of you will be familiar with this area. Uh, after uh, Gorgie and Sopton and Bowl Green, the river goes into Murrayfield. The training pitches and Roseburn Park around Murrayfield Stadium are the largest, uh, the last big remaining floodplain on the Water of Leith. After Murrayfield, the river uh, goes uh, under Castorfan Road and then heads towards um, the Gallery of Modern Art, Dean Village, uh, and then Stockbridge. This is the river as it comes through Cannon Mills, Warriston and St. Mark's Park. Uh, and you can see here, there's a lot of work that has been carried out on the river here. And this was the flood defense scheme, which was completed two years ago. Then the river goes through Red Braes and Bonnington until it really opens out into the Port of Leith. Uh, uh, it goes up as far as the Victoria Swing Bridge that we can access, but downstream of there it's Forth Ports Authority land and the artificial harbour gate that takes you into the Firth of Forth. 
The Water of Lee um, was very industrial. There's only 55 listed here, but there were in its heyday 70 working water mills along that stretch of the river between Belerno and Leith. <clears throat> this is just the mills between Belerno and Slateford, and you can see how densely they were uh, distributed along the river. The, the, there was, I mean, it was the main, one of the main employers, I would say, in areas along the river. Um, they were producing all sorts of different products, um, from paper, glue, cloth, flour, smice, spices, uh, and even snuff grinding. Here's some of the uh, pictures of the old mills along the Water of Leaf. This one here was the biggest mill on the Water of Leaf. This is Kinleaf Mill. Uh, it had a, its own railway siding, it employed um, uh, five, over 500 people uh, and uh, really uh, was a massive employer in the whole of the sort of curry area. Uh, paper making, the Water of Leaf was really a pioneer in paper making in Scotland. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the mills converted after they, they were originally walk mills and grain mills, and then they converted to paper when there was a real boom in that industry. This mill here, Bog's Mill, um, is in Craig Lockhart Dell, so sort of just between Slateford and Collington. Uh, and although the mill building doesn't exist now, uh, there is a road uh, and a bridge and a meadow all named after this mill. Uh, it was important because it made, it was another paper mill eventually, and it even made, it made 20 shilling banknotes. Uh, this is a picture of a, a snuff mill that no longer exists again along the water of Leith, uh, just upstream of Juniper Green. Uh, I love this mill, it's very beautiful. And I think uh, it's a shame that it was uh, demolished in the 19, I think about the 1920s. Um, this uh, of course is Cox's uh, glue mill that was in Gorgie. There's a picture of inside the mill there. And you'll all know that Scotch porridge oats was once along the water of Leith in Collington. Uh, from Slateford to Belerno, the water of Leith were mills were all serviced by the Belerno branch railway line, which opened in 1874. Now this closed the passengers in 1949 uh, and freight in 1968, uh, but it was a feat of engineering when it went in at the time. There were 28 bridges uh, and a tunnel, I'll tell you more about that later, and many cuttings and embankments, and it cost £134,000 and was largely built by hand. Uh, the Water of Leaf walkway follows the, the, the walkway shut um, uh, in, the, uh, 19, in the 1970s, that walkway was converted, the train line was converted to a walkway, which was like the beginning of the Water of Leaf walkway. Um, oh, sorry, gone the wrong way. And this is another major bit of engineering associated with the mills um, that there is uh, not many remains of now, but it is still possible to see. Uh, now, the location of where my cursor is on this bottom left slide is um, just downstream of Dean Bridge, if you're familiar with that area in Edinburgh. So it's looking towards Stockbridge. That's St Bernard's Well in the background. Uh, and this area here was an old mill. Uh, and it's this wooden platform was the... Um, the or just the other side of this was the, um, the Great Laid along the Water of Leith. So there's um, the biggest weir on the Water of Leith is in Dean Village. It's called the World's End Weir. And the re one of the reasons that it's so big is that it serviced all the mills, if you look at the map, um, from this area all the way cut across. It was a trough on wooden stilts and it cut across from Saunders Street along Silver Mills until it reached the little mill lock at Cannon Mills. Um, you can, if you walk that area, still see in bridges, little arches that have been bricked up where the great lathe used to go through it. The last mill closed in the 1970s along the Water of Leith uh, and a little bit like the arches that have been bricked up. It's only relics of the milling industry that you can find along the Water of Leith now. This is a picture here of the largest weir on the Water of Leith that I was just talking about which is just upstream of the Dean Bridge and it's called the World's End Weir. 
mostly because when you're standing on the village bridge in Dean, Dean Village and looking downstream at the bottom of Bell's Bray, it looks like the river is sort of dropping off the end of the world. Um, there's a very deep pool just where the water, uh, where the, the, the weir water goes uh, into the river. Uh, and it's up to here that we get salmon on the water of Leith. Other relics of the milling industry in, in Dean Village include this, these three millstones here that are on the site of Lindsay's mill. So you can see the Dean Bridge behind, and this is, these mills are there as a monument to uh, Lindsay's mill. Uh, and you can see that they are very different from this millstone here that's below it. Now this is a, a, in Belerno, this millstone, and it's at the site of new mills. And that's just one solid piece of stone, probably came from Scotland. Whereas when they started importing grain from America, um, the boat journey made the drain very, very dry, the grain very, very dry. And they couldn't, they couldn't crush it with the normal millstones. Well, they could, but the millstones weren't lasting very long. So they started importing quartz from France uh, and then binding them all together with uh, an iron hoop. There's an old ruined kiln from Curry Mill uh, and there are two water wheels left on the water of Leith. This one is at Bonnie Hoch, so downstream of um, Cannon Mills, but before you reach uh, Leith. And it's not the original wheel, but it is in the original lade. Uh, and it's not visible from the river. You have to go to the old um, mill houses just off Bonington Road to see it. There are a lot of old lades and sluice gates uh, and sometimes you really have to look to see them because they're getting very overgrown uh, and disappearing. One of the books that we sell at the Water of Leith is The Water Mills of the Water of Leith, written by Dr. Graham Priestley, that was a, a colleague of mine when I first started at the Trust 20 years ago. Um, his book categorically goes through every mill that was ever on the Water of Leith, uh, and he's gathered as much information as he can. Uh, about each mill and that's really important because these relics of the milling industry are disappearing but it's all industrial heritage that really played a big role in developing Ele uh, Edinburgh into the city that it was today. So um, we have at least got some record of the mills uh, even though they are to a point um, becoming, uh, the relics are becoming few and far between. Um, there are many significant crossings uh, old Ford sites and impressive bridges <coughs> over the Water of Leith. The three on this slide, the top one here is um, of course Slateford Aqueduct, where the Union Canal crosses over the Water of Leith. Uh, this bridge here is Gillespie Bridge in Collington, but the most famous and perhaps the most impressive of course is the Dean Bridge in this lower slide. Dean Bridge was completed in 1832 it was commissioned by John Learmouth, the Lord Provost at the time. People say uh, because he owned all the property on the other side of the river. And until this bridge was built, the only way of crossing the river was to go down Bell's Bray and over the old village bridge that was built in the 1600s. Now, Dean Village wasn't as, um, uh, solu well, it was quite industrial uh, before uh, in the 1800s. There were uh, 11 working water mills on that S bend of the river and tanneries too. And people said that if you went down Bell's Bray and over the other side of the river, you come out the other side and you would be coated in flour. Uh, and it was quite a smelly river at those times. The interceptor sewers didn't go in until 1850 either. So John Liam have commissioned a more salubrious crossing of the river here. <clears throat> it's 90 uh, feet tall. And as soon as they put the bridge into place, um, it didn't have this parapet and people started jumping off it, unfortunately. So uh, quite soon afterwards, they, they raised uh, the, the, the height of the bridge to stop that from happening. So much so that when you cross um, over Queensferry Road now, it's, uh, it's hard to see you know, how impressive that bridge is from the top. And it always makes me feel a bit strange if I have to stand on tiptoes to look over the edge of the bridge because it is so high. 
Um, there is a story and a monument to a sailor that jumped off the Dean Bridge after the parapet was put in place with an umbrella. Uh, and he uh, actually came down and landed it quite well um, and survived. Uh, and he went down to the bars in Leith and was bragging about what he'd done, but nobody believed him. So he did it again, but he didn't survive the second time. <laughs> and if you look over the parapet of the bridge, there is a little plaque to him. Uh, uh, to say that uh, to, in some way to mark that moment in history. Other bits of social history along the water of Leith are of course the grottos in Craiglock Art Dell. Um, this one here is just along from Slateford, but there are three of them in the Dells um, uh, that were put in in the uh, 17, I think 1750s. Um, but uh, uh, everybody will recognize um, this structure, which is just upstream of Saunders Street in um, uh, Stockbridge. So uh, this was St Bernard's Well, um, which was um, a mineral spa. And it is possible to still go inside St Bernard's Well uh, on doors open day when it was safe to do so. Um, the Dean Village Association opened St Bernard's Well. Uh, and uh, every Sunday um, uh, you, during the festival, you can get access. And if ever I do a guided walk in the area, I also have keys to let you inside. And it is a beautiful building. <clears throat> uh, it's a domed ceiling. Uh, it's all mosaic. Uh, the stars are gold leaf. Um, they glitter when you light a candle. Uh, the pump still works uh, and the water comes out. Um, uh, and it was believed to have healing qualities. So Stockbridge was a little bit like a spa village uh, back in the day. And people would come and they would open the well at 5 a.m. and pay five shillings to drink from the water. The water was uh, not very nice tasting. Uh, and in fact, they had a little stove inside to heat the water so that they could make coffee out of it. I once gave a talk to a group in Long Nidri and a lady there said that her grandfather that was in, the in his 90s used to go and drink from the water every, sun every Sunday morning, mostly because he had a terrible hangover. And he said it was a brilliant cure. Um, but uh, uh, it was actually closed due to contamination in the 1950s. They tested the water and it was proved to be too high in sulfur for human consumption. Um, but the pump still works uh, and the water comes out of the lion's mouth there. Very interesting building. So uh, what is or who are the Water of Leaf Conservation Trust? So we were established in 1988 by residents that were concerned about Edinburgh's river and, the, and its future. And they made a friends group, basically, friends of the Water of Leaf Conservation Trust. And then in 1997, the Trust was successful in obtaining funding from the Millennium Commission, which was sort of the first wave of lottery funding to come into uh, Scotland. This was matched uh, by the City of Edinburgh Council and Leal to make a five million pound capital project to complete the Water of Leith walkway. So it connected all the uh, bits of the walkway. So the bit between that was the Belerno branch railway line was already there. Um, and it went down to Slateford, but there was no bit that went from Slateford to Gorgie or Slateford to Sockton. So they, uh, we organised connecting all the existing bits together so that you could walk continuously from Belerno to Leith. They also converted the old Slateford school into the Water of Leith Visitor Centre, uh, which is still open today, 20 years later. Um, these days, um, the Trust has got uh, quite diverse aims to when it was established as a friends group back in 1988. So now it's sort of developed and its key aims are to raise awareness of the river as Edinburgh's key environmental asset, to provide quality lifelong learning service, to encourage the protection and the enhancement of biodiversity along the river, to convert... Um, could, uh, sorry, to conserve the water of leaf by fostering practical action and to promote the water of leaf walkway for the enjoyment of the public. And um, we work with all the stakeholders, the landowners and the official bodies responsible for the river to promote the effective management of the whole river valley. <clears throat> so the walkway 
is uh, 12 and three quarters miles long and it starts or ends in Bologna and it goes to Leith. Um, so this is, uh, we put in many connection routes as well. So there's these set of steps here that are between the Slateford Aqueduct and Viaduct so that the Water of Leith walkway connects to another long distance walkway, which was the Union Canal towpath. This is uh, a, a, a lot of volunteers and members walking the whole of the walkway when it was first put in place. And if you look at the tunnel there, you'll see it's quite a, a dark, dank, um, railway tunnel that had lights that half the time didn't work and it was a little bit intimidating to go through um, but that's no longer the case as a new mural has gone in uh, through Collington Tunnel which uh, when restrictions lift is really worth a visit it's it's completed now uh, and it's really colourful and it's it's got the the words to a Robbie uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's poem running all the way through it uh, and it's been illustrated not just by uh, uh, the great artist that did the uh, thing, but also by um, uh, the school children of Benali Primary School as well, and some other uh, local youth groups. Um, so one of the wonderful things about the Water of Leith is even though you're right in the middle of a city, um, this slide, for instance, is taken uh, just underneath the steps near the Gallery of Modern Art. And you can stand here and you're only 10 minutes away from Princess Street, but all you can hear is the water rushing over the weir, birds singing, you'll see herons, swans, a dipper, uh, many wildflowers, and you feel like you're in the countryside. And that's so important when you're living in a, in a big city. Uh, it's the natural heritage that never fails to surprise me, uh, even after 20 years of working on uh, this very small river. There are 93 different species of aquatic plants along the water of Leith. So these are plants that like to have their roots immersed in water. They're really water loving plants. Things like stream water crowfoot, water avens, water forget me not, cuckoo flower and greater woodruff. There are lots of diverse species of flowers that are existing in the woodland along the water of Leith. One of the things I love about the river when I visit it is that a lot of it is wooded either side. Um, and that provides a habitat, not just for uh, river loving species, but also um, for uh, a, a massive diverse amount of things. I always think that you get your biggest amount of species when you have different habitats meeting. So woodland meeting, uh, freshwater habitat, meeting a sunny meadow area uh, and where all those changes are between the habitats, you get the most amount of different species. Here's some meadow species, and I'll tell you more about our meadow, uh, meadows a bit later, but uh, we have some really, really um, diverse levels of uh, wildflowers growing in them. In the water itself, there are uh, many different species of hundreds and hundreds of different species of invertebrates. Uh, here's some examples of them here. Any, any invertebrate that you see with three tails, is like these, these guys here, this one with three tails, three tails, three tails. They're all mayflies and we have um, 10 different species of mayfly in the water of leaf. Uh, they are a pollution indicator because they die really quickly if the water quality goes down in any way. So it's really important to monitor uh, whether we're finding mayflies in the water of leaf and uh, maintain their diversity. Um, there are uh, many different species of fish in the river that are eating all these invertebrates in the river that are dependent on the aquatic plants. And uh, there's a few listed here, brown trout, it is actually a brown trout fishery, the water of leaf, and you can fish by free permit between April and September. Uh, but there's also minnows, sticklebacks, stone loach, eels, two different species of lampreys, graylings, bullheads, the species that you wouldn't normally find in a, a river type environment that have come in either from the reservoirs, um, up from the fourth estuary, or uh, from the Union Canal, which crosses over the water of leaf in Slateford. And they're things like rainbow trout, perch, pike, salmon, and flounder. Um, this is a, uh, I've been working recently this year um, with the Fourth Rivers Trust because um, there's some work going on but well needed work going on by Scottish Water to upgrade all the combined sewage overflow outlets into the water of Leith. Um, 
but before they because of covid they had to do their in-stream work in a period of time when you wouldn't normally allow that to happen because it's when the fish are spawning so we put in quarter dams around the areas where they were working uh, and then went in just before they started the walk and electrofished the whole area and took out every fish within the quarter dam uh, and moved it basically which is what this uh, electrofishing gear is all about and that's me returning the fish back to the river so that they could complete their in-stream work without uh, killing any fish. It's a good job that we've got so many fish because there's lots of things that eat them. It's a very common sight to see a heron along the water of leaf. We've got a really healthy population using the water of leaf for their daily fishing ground. Um, I've seen them catch some very impressively large trout and managed to swallow them. And eels too. We have some quite big eels in the water of leaf and it's always a little bit of a roller coaster watching a uh, heron eat an eel. Uh, my favourite aquatic bird on the water of leaf is this little fella. It's the dipper, uh, perfectly evolved for a, a, a Scottish river with its brown feathers and its white front, meaning that when it's bobbing up and down on a rock in the middle of the river, it's difficult to spot it. But I always hear a dipper because it's got a beautiful song. Uh, and it's actually one of the only aquatic birds that does have a song. Kingfishes don't have a song, for instance. Um, they just have a call. Here's the kingfisher, a very healthy population of kingfishers along the water of Leith, and we get sightings on a more than daily basis uh, all along the river from Leith uh, uh, all the way up to the source. Um, it's not just birds that are thriving along the water of Leith. Um, we've got um, often getting uh, foxes uh, being sighted along the riverbanks and squirrels coming down to drink from the water. Um, some of the largest and biggest badger sets are along the water of Leith uh, and roe deer I have seen as far down as Gorgie using the water of Leith as a green motorway connecting um, the Pentlands effectively to the city. This guy here is a mink and we do have mink on the water of Leith but it's not one of our native species, it's an American mink. Um, Quite often you have a problem with these on watercourses in Scotland, mainly because of the mink industry where they were making um, kind of mink coats and things and they had mink farms. Obviously that, that's not going on anymore, but sometimes those mink escaped and because they have no natural predators, their uh, population uh, just balloons along watercourses. And 20 years ago, when I first started along the water of Leith, we always saw mink. There were lots and lots and lots of them. And people used to ring up from Stockbridge and say, oh, I've, um, there's mink on my balcony. If I open my door, will they run in to my house? And I used to say, yes, they will. <laughs> don't, don't touch them. You know, keep your doors shut if you've got mink on your door. Uh, and every sighting that people used to say was an otter was always a mink. And we used to have to grill people about the size of the animal uh, and what its behavior was because it was very rare to see otters and it was very, very common to see mink. But now, 20 years later, that is no longer the case. The mink population has dropped significantly and the otter population has increased significantly. Um, now, uh, when I first started, it took me 10 years to see my first otter on the water of Leith. And now I, uh, we get reports daily and I've seen them hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, just yesterday, I uh, was sent a photograph of a brand new cub uh, on the water of Leith. Um, the population in lockdown uh, was became it became clear what the population was a bit more during lockdown because there was more people out and about on the river and reporting their sightings. Uh, and in the summer last year, there were nine otters using the water of Leith that we knew of. And they were different otters because people were reporting them so often that I started requesting that they told me the time of their sighting. And I've recorded it all on a spreadsheet and I could quite clearly see that there was an otter being spotted in Leith at the same time as one was being spotted in Belerno. So it was a different otter. And just based on those kind of recordings, uh, I started to be able to, to bring a picture. I've done an otter survey, which I completed at the end of last, at the beginning of last year. So I had a sort of idea about their populations anyway, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. 
What became really interesting in lockdown was that people were taking such fantastic photographs. The photographs were so good that you could you can you can see sort of characteristic markings on them. So this otter, for instance, has a we called a Emscar nose uh, because he had a pink marking, or her actually, on her on her nose. It's actually quite common for otters to have that scar scarring on their nose because when they mate, the males often grab the female by the nose, which leaves scars. Um, so uh, it became started to become possible to distinguish between the otters just by markings on their face or a notch off their ear or um, maybe a missing tooth. That's how good the photographs were. So um, we uh, obviously have the Water Relief Visitor Centre and we have a teacher that is employed with us, our outdoor learning officer, and that's, that's Ruth Prince, that's this lady here. And she runs a very successful primary outdoor education programme for the schools uh, in the Edinburgh area. Uh, we also have a secondary field studies uh, programme too. So high school students are coming out and finding high school biology and geography students are coming and finding out more about their local river and using it for their um, uh, exams and their studying. We do a lot of community engagement and fun normally along the water at Leaf. And while I was putting this talk together, it made me feel a little bit sad because obviously we haven't been doing that as much this year. Um, but normally every Tuesday and Thursday of the school holidays, we run a children's event um, uh, and we also do these big fun days and we have a summer club and um, we do treasure hunts and we all get dressed up and children go around the dells and try and work out puzzles and clues and things. But we haven't really been doing as much of that this year, but we hope to get back to that as soon as restrictions lift and it's possible again. Now, everything that we do is managed by, uh, is really only possible because of the volunteer team. We only have five members of staff, but we have a, a volunteer team of about 150 really active people. They come from all walks of life and they man the visitor center and the reception at the visitor center. They assist us with fundraising and they do administration, but by far the most amount of activity is done out on the river, practically looking after the river. Oh, sorry. In 2019-20, so before pre-COVID, uh, the Trust carried out 6,990 hours of practical tasks along the water of Leith, uh, which if you times it by the living wage, uh, came to 70,591 um, pounds worth of work uh, on the river carried out by volunteers. Now, obviously that was totally curtailed during COVID, um, but we still managed in very safe, small teams run on a very frequent basis to keep on top of all the management issues that, that needed to be done during COVID. So um, it's far reduced because the teams were so small, but the work was harder in a way because pre-COVID, we would go out in teams of between 15 and 30 people at a time, maybe twice a week. Uh, but during COVID, we were going out seven, nine times a week with teams of between four and six people. So uh, we could do it if it was outside and we had to be socially distanced from each other. Uh, and we managed uh, when we weren't in stiff lockdown to carry out 2,647 hours of conservation work, which meant we could cover the essential work. So um, initially we started just looking after controlling giant hogweed and then we widened the walkway so it was big enough for people to get socially distanced while they're out taking their daily exercise. And that was the first thing that we did and the council requested that we did that for them um, because none of their workers were out on the river. Um, so we did that in a very safe way, carefully during lockdown, just to allow public access because the, the river has never been busier since COVID hit. So um, the types uh, of teams that we have going out on the river, not in COVID times, but in um, but normal times, are uh, conservation teams of our own volunteers, youth groups, community groups, and corporate groups. Uh, and you can see the type of work that we're doing here. 
a big part of the work that we do is litter cleanups. Uh, and this is both on the river banks and along the path along that 13 miles of walkway and a large amount of it is in the river itself. So we're always putting on waders, we're always using grappling hooks and ropes. Uh, uh, a cleanup is not a cleanup without finding a supermarket trolley and a traffic cone uh, and uh, we're out hauling all the litter that comes out of the water of Leith. Um, we never do a conservation task without some element of a litter cleanup going on at the same time. Um, if you don't get litter out of an urban river, it becomes a problem. Um, and it is an ongoing problem that you can never be complacent about uh, on any urban river. Uh, the litter itself makes the river look polluted and neglected. And sometimes it's dumped by people that can't be bothered to go to the tip. And sometimes it's just windblown out of bins and skips uh, along the water of Leith. Um, but because the river is constantly flowing towards Leith, towards the fourth estuary, if we don't pick the litter up, it just ends up trapped on the boom down at Leith. There's an artificial boom to stop the litter and the woody debris getting into Fourth Ports Authority land just before the artificial harbour gate, because otherwise it would harm, I think, their boats coming in and out. Um, but the problem is, if you don't get the litter out, it flows downstream and it piles up behind this boom and you end up with um, a lot of litter down there. Uh, and uh, in the, at the end of 2019, um, there was so much public outcry about the buildup of litter down in Leith um, uh, that uh, the trust took a central role in organizing um, the Water of Leaf Basin Litter Agreement. So we, um, it's not owned by the council, it's a private landowner. And he wasn't able to clear the litter up from the whole of the city. Uh, it just was out of hand for him to be able to do that. Uh, and the council didn't own the land, so they didn't feel like they could go in and clear it up either. And it was a complete stalemate for years because nobody could go in because it's too deep to wade. And because of the artificial harbour dates, there's a buildup of silt, which is unpredictably deep. So it is, it's quite unsafe to go in. You need, you need boats to do it. Um, and eventually we neg negotiated to borrow a boat we agreed to go in on a monthly basis and do a cleanup of the litter basin. And then when the woody debris really builds up and we can't get the boat through it, the um, council and Fourth Ports Authority bring in a high app vehicle and take out the, the, heavy, the heavy wood. That goes off for biofuel. So we have to pick out the plastic litter between it um, before. And we go out on a monthly basis. This, this is us in the boat. It's a flat bottomed metal boat. I love it. It's not very beautiful to look at, but it's so stable. Um, we have an outboard motor. So we jump in the boat down uh, a near ocean mist, mist. Four of us can fit in the boat, but at the moment we're only going in with two people because it's not, we can't get socially distanced otherwise. But it's quite physical work. We've got long litter pickers and rakes it's absolutely exhausting actually. And we pull out ton bags and ton bags of flask plastic bottles and balls, so many balls. These, these are all the balls that we pulled out the week before last that were collected on the, the boom. Um, there's these sunny sort of glady meadow areas along the water of Leith. Um, and we manage them like old fashioned med meadows as if they were grazed, because I think that's what used to happen. These hochlands basically, which are floodplains. Everything on the meadow uh, and basically cut the meadow and then there'd be no, there'd be a few droppings, but not many uh, because they'd be moved on to another places. Uh, and when you have that kind of uh, cutting regime, you get more diverse species. If you leave the vegetation on the ground, what happens is you have a, a buildup of nutrients and only the 10 dominant species um, thrive there. So in this meadow area at Bell's Mill, this was what it was like, and it, it was not unpleasant, but there was only 10 species of plants. So by cutting the meadow by hand, by raking the meadow, 
by, uh, well, we cut it by hand and then we leave the cuttings on the meadow for a few weeks. So the seeds drop and then we rake it off uh, and we do seed collection and we bring on those seeds and we put them back into the meadow uh, and um, we do plug planting and um, just generally try to increase the biodiversity of the plant life in these sort of sunny glade meadow areas. Uh, and we've started to really increase the amount of different species. So at Bells Mill Meadow, we started off with 15 species and we now have over 70 different species of, of wildflower. So that's really good for all the invertebrates in the area. Um, I believe that if you get the plants right along the edges of the water of leaf, the rest will follow um, just because it's a, an ecosystem that's all depending on each other. So if you have a really rich species of aquatic plants or meadow plants or woodland plants, um, uh, that you'll get the invertebrates that you need and then everything that eats those invertebrates will come, eventually leading up to our higher mammal, mammals like otter. We have other biodiversity boost sites along the Water of Leaf, which are community gardens as well. So we have Graham's Garden in Belerno. We have the Medicinal Gardens in, at St. Bern as well. And we have um, Bowl Green Garden as well. So these are they're like gardening sites that are managed by the community, but they only have native species in them. There are a lot of invasive plants along the water of leaf, uh, and just to increase biodiversity, we try and keep on top of them. So um, some plants are non-native, but not invasive. So things like um, honesty isn't, this is this plant down here, isn't too bad. Um, it's not native to the water of leaf. It's quite pretty, but it's not invasive. So it doesn't take over to become a monoculture. But things like Himalayan balsam, giant hogweed and Japanese knotweed do become a monoculture and they um, lower biodiversity and the amount of plant species that can thrive along the riverbed. Um, one thing that we do with our volunteer teams is pull, hand pull Himalayan balsam along the water of leaf. Uh, and uh, we're quite, we've got such a big volunteer team that could go out so regularly and they're so great with their waders and, I'll, I'm, and using the boats and everything, we can get to some quite inaccessible places. Um, so uh, we tend to pull balsam um, and uh, we normally do it, we try and get on top of it as much as we can before it seeds. So we've got quite a small window before it coming out of the ground and seeding. Um, but uh, once it does start, to flower, we cut the flower heads off and take them away. Um, and if we've pulled it once, the chances are we can pull it again later in the season because it will, we will have knocked it back a little bit. But we, we pull sites two or three times a year, the same sites, and we work from the, the most upstream plant all the way down to leaf, uh, trying to reduce it so we can increase biodiversity. Problem with balsam is it's got these lovely big flowers, which bees prioritize over other flowers. Uh, and if we remove the balsam, they'll go to the native plants and cross-pollinate them. Um, we also manage Japanese knotweed and uh, giant hogweed. Um, and both of these plants, you can't really, or most people that manage freshwater habitats have found that you can't really manage them effectively without the use of a herbicide uh, like glyphosate, but I'm sure a lot of you are aware that uh, glyphosate isn't necessarily great for invertebrates or for human health. So we're part of a pioneering project at the moment to try and reduce the amount of glyphosate that we use on the water of leaf. Um, so uh, we, I map every year the amount of giant hogweed along the whole length of the river. Uh, and I'm working with Napier University as part of a five year project to trial different things with controlling giant hogweed. So I have quadrats set up and I map the amount of plants in them and then I control them and then I revisit them uh, uh, and see how well the plant is being controlled. I always control the plant. We are still managing giant hogweed and we do still use glyphosate to do that. But we also use digging as a method uh, and we use a reduced glyphosate application as well as our three methods. Um, the digging is quite interesting. This is um, giant hogweed when it's very in its infancy, in its first year. And you, when it's tiny like that, it basically looks like a carrot. I mean, it is in the carrot family. 
Uh, and if you're careful, if you completely cover any exposed skin, wear goggles, gloves, use a very sharp spade and dig in underneath the root and get the whole root out, you can get it quite safely. But the problem is you can't leave the plant uh, to just rot uh, in a public space because it is harmful. More so actually when it's little, it's more potent. The sap brings you out in blisters and can cause asphyxiation. So it has to be controlled because it's a public health risk. So we then take this plant away and leave it to rot before we put it into compost. So it's safe. We also use stem injectors to control um, Japanese knotweed. And that is a, um, stem injectors are a very direct application of the herbicide. So it can't spread anywhere else, but it's very labor intensive. And when it comes to Japanese knotweed, um, there's nothing else that you can do uh, to control it. And Japanese knotweed has got such a strong root system that it can compromise building structure and wall structure. So it has to be controlled. Um, uh, but uh, we, do, we have been trialing injecting um, neat coffee into Japanese knotweed because it was told that that could kill it. But actually we haven't had very positive results from that. So we're still looking for other alternatives. Um, I manage with my giant hogweed project between Slateford and Juniper uh, and Curry, which is where the highest giant hogweed plant is. Um, giant hogweed, you can see on this heat map that where I manage with reduced glyphosate, there's a lot less giant hogweed than the downstream section, which is managed by the special grounds maintenance team of the council, um, just with glyphosate spray, backpack sprayers. So I, even though I'm doing a research project about it, which is why I'm managing this top bit of the river, I do believe that with reduced glyphosate, you can have better results than using uh, the normal amount of glyphosate uh, for controlling the water of leaf. I do also know that this real hotspot of giant hogweed here at Longstone is all because there's a, a lot of hogweed coming into the river from the Murray Burn. So this year we aim to go up the Murray Burn and control the giant hogweed there. But as well as all that work, we do path work, we do woodland management, we build fences, benches, drainage ditches, we put in signs and steps and railings, we do willow spiling and, and other tasks, anything that needs to be done along the water of Leith. Uh, I do a lot of research that I've already mentioned, the giant hogweed work. Um, I'm also surveying the river for trout spawning habitat um, and uh, I have done an otter survey. So the otter survey was very interesting and all the volunteers helped that we patrolled the city stretch of the river and we collected sprint from every stretch of the river every two weeks, just partial samples of the sprint. And then an ecologist from Oban that was doing an MSc for Edinburgh University analyzed all those sprint under a microscope. And she was able to work out what fish bones and invertebrate bones and um, amphibian bones were in the sprain of the otter so that we could work out what the diet of the otters and the distribution of the otters are on the water of Leith. That um, project uh, was in conjunction with the International Otter Survival Fund and we hope to publish it in their journal this year. Um, we found evidence of otters on every stretch of the river between Belerno and Leith. I've got another MSc student from Napier University lined up to repeat that survey but on the upstream section of the river. Um, obviously, we're also doing bat box surveys um, and electro fishing surveys and aquatic plant surveys and meadow surveys and giant hogweed surveys, and Japanese knotweed surveys. And that's mostly carried out by um, volunteers. Uh, I'll, I'll give them their stretch, I'll give them their training and they go out and do it. So the water of leaf is quite a river. It's very important. We don't own any of it. There's no one landowner that's owned by anybody who owns the property either side of it up to the middle point. So uh, there's uh, many different owners and there's many different stakeholders as well. So it's really important that we have a management plan that everybody's working from, the same management plan. There's so much pressures from either development, 
um, or pollution or sewage or the fishing rights. There's so many different elements um, of uh, the Water of Leith that um, we have written for the second decade, the management plan for the Water of Leith. Um, you can download this document from our website. Uh, there's the, the link there. Um, and really the plan, uh, which is written afresh every 10 years, um, uh, covers all the major issues uh, relating to the river. And it basically has a load of actions in it. And um, people have committed to fulfilling those actions on a 10 yearly basis. Um, <clears throat> and those actions are covered by water, water objectives, habitat and species, recreation and access, engagement and education, heritage, landscape and geodiversity, planning development and resilience to climate change. Um, and the last management plan, we were really focused on the flood defense scheme and helping the river recover from the hard engineering that went into that. But this 10 years, uh, the main focus of the management plan is going to be rejuvenating the, the, the mouth of the watery leaf in leaf, and then looking at the upper catchment and what can be done to improve the <clears throat> the biodiversity upstream of Belerno. Uh, and also we're looking uh, obviously at climate change resilience and upgrading the river to a good status um, uh, as applicable to the Water Framework Directive, which is an objective that the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency has for all Scottish rivers by 2027. Because the Water of Leaf is um, an old milling river, uh, and even the levels of water are managed by the reservoirs in the Pentland and the artificial harbour gates, it's classed as poor quality, even though it has such rich biodiversity and is so heavily used by wildlife and people within Edinburgh. The reason that it's poor is because it's a heavily modified water body. So by 2027, SEPA want to have the river into a good water quality. So they're now looking at removing the man-made elements on the river um, and I don't know where this is going to go and it's been a bit delayed by Covid but um, it's the focus will probably be on removing the barriers to fish passage along the water of Leith. That's why I'm doing all this trout habitat survey and electro fishing work at the moment and I'll be working with Fall Rivers Trust and um, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that any more water, money that does come um, the way, that way for the water of leaf to improve its status can be best spent uh, for the uh, um, improvement of biodiversity. Um, I've been going on a bit, <laughs> but that's the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions?